Welcome to Connected Families. This is the Connected Families podcast. I'm Stacy, your host. I'm so glad that you tuned in. In today's episode, I'm going to be talking with Jim and Lynn, Jim and Lynn Jackson, co-founders of Connected Families for part two of a discussion about one of the things that makes Connected Families unique from others. We're going to talk about how the biblical perspective and science, meaning science of the brain and other therapies are integrated into how we approach parenting. So welcome Jim and Lynn to the podcast. Hey, thanks, Stacy. Thank you, Stacy. Good to be with you to talk about brains and Bibles. <laughs> <laughs> hey, BB, brains and Bibles. You know, last time we had a fun conversation, didn't we? we it did. was awesome. It, it was so good. And I think that it was just so clear why brains and Bible <laughs> or Bible and science and research are part of our secret sauce. And that is because like, we just got going and it just flowed last time, didn't it? Yeah, it, it was, sure did. We're well, passionate about it. We're <laughs> passionate about it. It, uh, it flowed because, I mean, honestly, this idea, these ideas, the things we're talking about right now are at the heart of, of connected families, who we are, how we got here, how we started, you know, nearly 20 years ago. You know, this whole idea of humans and connection and the need for solid, good, connected instruction and, you know, all these things. We saw early on that so much of the conventional Bible teaching about parenting, it was good theologically, but it was just so difficult practically. And then some of it didn't work out very well. And we started digging, digging, digging and paying close attention to our experience. And it led us to read, you know, what are the scientists saying? What are the researchers saying? What are the, you know, what are the groups saying? And in the last episode, we talked about this, this document called Hardwired to Connect that was put out by a big group of 33 scholars, who's who think tank of children development experts around the country. And it just almost, when we got that document in 2003 or something, it just sang to us like, oh my gosh, research affirms all of this discovery we've been making. These were scholars from Harvard, Columbia, Princeton, Yale. I mean, the big names, they were talking about Christ-centered relationships and the impact of the church on children, but they were using different words, but that's really what they, mm -hmm. were, they were talking mm -hmm. about. So it was just exciting when we got that. that. And you know, in our community has so appreciated the two of you and how you're 100% committed to the Bible and being founded in scripture and all that we teach in scripture, but then also your interest in research and science and how that comes in and makes it practical and gives us really practical everyday tools to use as parents. And so I think our whole community appreciates that. We've heard that over and over again. And so Jim and Lynn, last time we started to kind of break this all down based on the framework, which the two of you developed and that every topic that we deal with goes through the framework. And so in our last episode, which we strongly encourage everyone to go back and listen to, if you haven't yet, we went through the foundation and then the second level, the second level, which is connect, connect, connect. <laughs> Jim connect. It's like your favorite spot, isn't it? And we yeah. covered them then. Yeah. yeah. And so today we're going to cover the next two layers of the framework, which is coach and then correct. Right. So start us off with coach Lynn. Well, coach is really about, it's centered on that our kids are created in the image of God, you know, in Genesis. And then in Psalm 139, it's our kids are miracles created by God for God's purposes. And as they enter into faith, and then in Ephesians 2.10, it says, as our kids are in Christ, we are God's workmanship created in Christ Jesus to do the good works, which he has prepared in advance. Oh, I love that too. verse. Love it. It's something we do as parents. And it sort of takes on the idea of both an athletic coach and a life coach. And it's it's about coming alongside, which is also a spiritual imagery there, parallel to what the Holy Spirit does for us, coming alongside to be a guide, to be a teacher, to set our kids up to succeed, recognizing God built them for a unique purpose in his image. And we're stewards of that. We're not owners of that. We don't get to decide what it is. God decided what it is. We get to help our kids discover what 
what that is and come alongside them in meaningful ways to help them explore, identify, and really grow in this identity of being built by God to do God's work. So why don't you share just that section from the Hardwired Connect research, which kind of says the same thing, but it's just really cool that these scholars acknowledge yep. that this was true. So in this document, Hardwired to Connect, published in the early part of the millennium, it says, we are impressed. This is a group of 33 scholars saying, we are impressed by mounting scientific evidence, suggesting that in two basic ways, the human child is hardwired to connect. First, we're hardwired to connect with other people. Second, we're hardwired to connect to moral meaning and to the possibility of the transcendent. The need in young people to connect to ultimate meaning and to the transcendent is not merely the result of social conditions, but it is instead an intrinsic aspect of the human experience. Okay, hold up. Yeah. Transcendent. You guys just send yeah. some red flags up in my mind. Explain that, especially in our context as faith people. Well, in another spot, they talk about a relationship with the divine. So uh -huh. in their scholarly way, they can't say God, but that's who they're talking about to a sense of that there is a God out there that's bigger than me. And he has a purpose for my life. Ultimately, that's what transcendent means. Something bigger than us. Yeah. So the scholars have recognized we need to lean into and get life from something bigger than us to help mm -hmm. us define who we are and what we do. And, you know, as Christians, we read this and we're like, well, yes, yeah. this is consistent with the biblical teaching. And so let's get on board with this. Mm -hmm. Some of our favorite verses that dovetail with this are 1 Thessalonians 2, 7 and 8, talking about this connection to other people. Just as a nursing mother cares for her children, so we cared for you because we loved you so so much. We were delighted to share with you not only the gospel of God, but our lives as well. So that's how Paul was nurturing his children, connecting with them, his children, which was the church. And then connected to meaning is in verses 11 and 12, just a few farther on. For you know how we dealt with each of you as a father deals with his own children, encouraging, comforting, and urging you to live lives worthy of God, <laughs> who calls you into his kingdom and glory. Talk about moral meaning and purpose in the transcendent. Mm -hmm. That just takes it to another level. <laughs> well, and it's, it's the essence of coach. It, it's about encouraging you to do what God built you to do and to do that in this context of connected relationship. And so for us, coach is about the efforts that we put into place to help our kids grow in this way. We affirm them. We help them by acknowledging when they do what we've invited them to think about or do, or when they do something new, we put good positive energy into the desired stuff of our kids' lives. And in that effort of affirming, you know, a lot of times parents go, oh yeah, I affirm my kid. Yay, way to go. Woohoo, you're awesome. You're the best. Yeah. Woohoo, you're so smart. But that's where we can get off track in our praise. And this is where scripture, again, dovetails with research. It's if we're doing that kind of praise for our kids, we're probably teaching them to be people pleasers. It's all about making mom and dad's face light up, having them tell me I'm so smart. I'm so awesome. And yeah, so it's external motivation rather than internal. It right. can be. Mm -hmm. yeah. And so in Proverbs 29, five, it says a person who flatters his neighbor is spreading a net for him to step into. It's talking about that people pleasing is a net, a trap that we can get sucked into. Mm -hmm. And so that guides us to not want to do that as parents, <laughs> but then what might that look like? And there's some just amazing research uh, done by Carol Dweck. She took 400 students, divided them to two groups, gave them first test was an easy test. One group was praised for being an intelligent. You must be smart at this. The other group was praised for their effort. You must have worked really hard at this. Then she gave them a difficult test. The effort praised kids worked harder, longer, and enjoyed the challenge. The kids praised for their intelligence were frustrated and gave up easier. Then there was a final test similar to the first one. The kids praised for being smart were dropped 20% in their score. The kids praised for their effort increased 30%. 
was a difference of 50%. Mm -hmm. So that just gives us specific ideas on how to affirm our kids the way God would want us to, you know, for their effort, their faith, their character, not for their giftedness or their being so smart, the the ways that they cooperate in walking out the gifting that God has given them. And to get really practical about that, because I see this and I've even done this myself. You know, we, we watch parents all the time, their kids do a thing and the parent turns to them and says, oh, good job. I'm so proud of you. It's our thought when kids' faces light up that they're more into the like, oh, I'm proud of you. I did a good thing. I pleased somebody. So I'll, uh, you know, I'll learn that my value comes from pleasing people. And parents miss the opportunity when they say good job to dig into the heart of that and be more descriptive about what was good Mm -hmm. about that job. So I could see you really concentrated hard. And I watched how, you know, depending on what the task might be, I watched, you know, how you work to follow the rules or stay in the lines, or, you know, you work to honor the other people, or you worked to be a team player, or you concentrated so well at that really difficult spot. You know, we have a great job to coach our kids in this ethic of hard work that the research says is so important. We have a heart to have our kids feel good about what they're doing. And we tend to skip the hard work and go to the easy work, which is nice job. Maybe we weren't even paying attention that closely. Uh, Maybe we just know that that's what you're supposed to say to your kids when they're done with a thing so we can move on to the next thing. But I, I would encourage listeners, if you tell your kids, good job, that's great. Now dig beneath the depth of that and either ask your kids some questions about what they did that might have been good about that job or say some things to them about what was good about that job. And that's why we've developed actually kind of in response to some of this research, we developed a tip called ABC affirmations. And we'll put a link below in your show mm-hmm. notes about that for more practical ideas. But Stacy, let's turn the tables about questions and building wisdom, which is such a key part of yeah. coach. Yeah, Stacy and uh, one of our other colleagues, Chad, has built an online course about the power mm-hmm. of questions. And we love this course because it really invites that hard work that I'm talking about earlier for us as parents to really get under the surface of some of the quick ways that we tend to Uh, approach various challenges and be thoughtful about the questions we ask that build wisdom in our kids. As Lynn said, we'll turn the tables here for a minute and interview you. Tell us a little bit about building wisdom through questions and what you've discovered. Well, Jesus is our model. Jesus asked 307 questions in the Bible. Those are only the ones recorded, Jim and Lynn, like in Matthew 20, where he asked the two blind men on the side of the road, what do you want me to do for you? Now we know, right? Jesus knew the answers. Mm. He didn't really need that answer from those people, those blind men on the side of the road, but he wanted them to think through what did they need, which is growing wisdom. And so, you know, I love, I love that, that we're following Jesus. You already mentioned Psalm 139. My, you know, my child is God's handiwork. And I need to get really curious about how did God make this child, even this child different from my other child? Cause you know, and all of the children that we have in our house, they're all different and they all have different personalities. And so as I grow in curiosity about what makes them different, how God made them, then I want to ask questions for me. One of my guiding verses, especially as my girls are teenagers now is Philippians one, six, he who started a good work will bring it to completion. And that translates into building wisdom because then when I'm having a conversation with one of them, for example, yesterday, my, I had a daughter and she was starting to tell me about a book that she had gotten from the library and she was reading about some popular person. I'm just not going to even name names. Like everyone to know these names. And this person was writing about her alter ego. And I'm telling you, Jim and Lynn, I had all these opinions that are just like stirring around in my mind. Like I wanted to just tell her what I thought about, you know, what is an alter ego? You know, I'm going to tell you what it is. You know, better than that. That's not the kind of thing we read around here. (laughs) Well, it was a biography. So even that I know, you know, all the things. So I pause. I thought, okay, my goal here is to grow wisdom and I can start asking questions about what she thinks about that. And the way that verse comes into it is that I don't have to give her my exact answer right then. I don't have to get to the end of the conversation where I set her straight. I can trust that the Lord has her and has her on the journey. 
And I love that part. And the research that I think fits into that and, and that applies to it is this research tells us that people who show interest in their conversational partner's viewpoint, and instead of telling right away, but they follow that up with questions, they are more liked and more likely to be picked in the future for interactions. Okay. So what that means is that when I'm listening and then I am showing interest and asking questions right away, that means I'm growing influence in my kid's life that they would want to come back to me later to continue conversations. So I just love, I love how that pairs together because that is my goal to grow wisdom in my girls and also to grow the influence that I want to have in their lives for the long term yeah, to be well, able to speak into their life. There's an undercurrent here of what you're talking about, Stacy, which is the undercurrent of trust being built. You know, our curiosity to be truly curious. I, I mean, it's, I think it's true that Jesus often knew the answers to the questions he asked because he was Jesus. <laughs> yep. <laughs> we are not Jesus. <laughs> Oftentimes our kids sort of will pick up on, like, we ask them a question with a little bit of a tone, you know, what are you supposed to do with that? Like, they know that we know the answer. It's not really a question. It's just sort of a sideways way of getting at them to do the thing they're supposed to do. That's not even always a bad thing to do necessarily. Like, what time is it? Oh my goodness, what time is it? It's getting to be bedtime. You know, so asking the kind of questions that open kids' brains, especially as our kids get older, requires that we truly are curious about the answers and our judgment mm -hmm. about whatever answer we might hear. I trust the Lord has my kids and their perspectives and, you know, their future growth. He ultimately has it. And I'm trying hard to be a tool in the hand of the Lord. Lord in those interactions. I love this. We're going to go to a break right now, but after the break, we want to talk more about Bible and science and how it relates to our current culture. So we'll see you after the break, Jim and Lynn. Hey friends, this is Stacy. I want to take a quick break in this episode to offer you one of our popular free resources called the four most important messages you can send your kids. What messages do you want to send your kids in your parenting? Are you sending them? Do your kids know they are loved no matter what, even during moments of discipline? The Discipline That Connects Parenting Framework has transformed countless families, like Allison's. She says, I never wanted to be an unsafe parent. Seeing these four messages made it clear what the foundation is, safety. I wish I had felt safe and I know I want my kids to feel it. I resonated with these messages and they remind me that there is hope and grace to be found as we parent. The four most important messages you can send your kids is free. I encourage you to go to our show notes for the link to download this free ebook. And like Allison, let it begin to transform your parenting too. Okay. Well, Jim and Lynn, we are back from the break and we want to move on. We're still in the layer of the framework called coach. And so let's talk about how we apply scripture to our current culture. <laughs> this is a big one. Who wants to jump in first? So that's the question. How do we apply scripture to our current culture? Yep. Wow. Well, the scriptures tell us that God's word is sufficient for everything and that we've been given everything we need for life and godliness. Amen. For me, that's the lens that I want to keep on as I work with children, my own and others, and with parents for that matter, in a way that doesn't just presume I'm going to tell you my interpretation of the Bible is the right interpretation and you should believe it. When we coach people with the belief that they are capable, that God is at work in them to bring that work to completion until the day of Christ, as you talked about before the break, we can suspend our need to tell them everything we think and what our opinions are about, about the scripture. There's a big movement right now in our culture. I have my truth and it's my truth and all truths are true. When we work mm. with our kids who are starting to come to us and say, you know, mom, dad, yeah, you believe all that stuff. And I, I'm, come, I'm having a new truth for me. If we tell them, well, you know, the Bible says, and no, you don't, and don't you go down that trail. And if that's our first approach to all of this, we tend, especially with our aging kids, to lose influence, not gain it, to lose trust, not gain it. So the question becomes, how do I need to respond right now, knowing what I know and interpreting the Bible, how I interpret the Bible? Mm -hmm. 
to raise my child's trust of me and to raise my sense of influence with them. And there's no one size fits all answer to this. But, you know, for me, I think for us at the core of it is we've got to suspend our quick judgments that are rooted in our fear of where this is going. If we let our kids keep talking this way. Yeah, I a hundred percent agree with that. And I would say even, you know, with my teenagers right now, it's even opinions about other things that are not coming from their mouth, but it's on the TV. It's about a friend. It's about something we hear about. It's even quick judgments about the things external from us, but they hear those judgments also. Mm -hmm. And that also shuts down conversation when we immediately want to put, you know, a Bible verse on it. And I I've experienced that. And so I feel that that's important to say right now. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I'm glad you did, because I think that we have this fear as parents, and it compels us to energetically (laughs) engage with our children in a way that tells them we're afraid of something. We don't use the words, Mm. but they know we're afraid. Mom is anxious. Dad is anxious. Mm. And then they don't believe me. What I'm saying doesn't have merit with them. Like they experience all these unspoken messages from us, which are not usually messages parents tell us they want to communicate to their kids. And so the wisdom, before we can build wisdom in our kids that's needed, is the wisdom ourselves to be reliant on God's spirit to give us guidance, to suspend our judgments. As I say that, I've got in the back of my mind, you know, real conversations I have with parents from time to time that say, but yes, we need to be judging. We need to judge right from wrong. And we need to make sure, yes, we do. But when we do it in a way that our kids get from us, the judgment, what they perceive is not right and wrong is important. What they perceive is you're wrong, child, and you are not valid to me because you're wrong. So that's where we've got to be thoughtful to back away a little bit and be prayerful, trusting that the Lord is in charge. The kids are watching our model. They're watching our example. They're, they're going to pay attention to our grace at times like this. And it's really important. I think that judgment also it comes across to them as a lack of compassion and a lack of love to the people around us. And in that they can shut off then our faith because it's a lack of compassion and love for people. And that's not a faith that they want to have. And so that quick judgment that comes out of fear, like you just said, or even needing to say the right thing, or, you know, the truth at the time can really be a turnoff of faith. Yep. Yep. So we invite parents really to think again, down the line of questions. First simple question. And and for parents that just really feel stuck, one of the great questions is, is what else do you want to say about that? Tell me more. What what else? What else? What else would you like to say about that? And what do you see is good about that way of thinking? And what do you see are the downsides of that sort of thinking? And again, opening your kids' brains to access things they've been taught in the past, words that have been spoken in the past, helping them learn to form their own way to really think deeply about these things. Mm-hmm is a really important step in coaching our kids toward true wisdom rather than just spitting an answer out that they're supposed to memorize and give from now on. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. So we had a post recently about a child who was addicted to Minecraft. His parents did so many things that were really yeah. wise, but one of them was they helped him to evaluate the value of his activities based on the scripture of Jesus grew in wisdom and stature and favor with God and man. So wisdom physical skills, relationship with God and relationship with people. They all did this together and they evaluated that. So scripture Mm -hmm. gives us that big picture and then we can use questions and research and Mm -hmm. all those kinds of things to guide our kids towards their own wisdom. So for example, a verse that can be really helpful in kids evaluate, helping the kids to evaluate the value of their screens or any other activity is 1 Corinthians 6.12, Paul is saying, basically, I have the right to do anything, you say, Mm -hmm. but not everything is beneficial. I have the right to do anything, but I will not be mastered by anything. So Paul is giving us a guideline for these choices in our culture that don't have specific commands about, in in the Bible, it doesn't tell us how much screen time to have. (laughs) Wouldn't it be nice if it did? That and sleep. How many hours a night should a five-year-old have to sleep? (laughs) Nope. But it gives us this guideline. Is it beneficial for us? Or is there a possibility that it's going to master us? Yes. And parents can equip themselves with research and just in a lighthearted way, share it with their kids. There was a study that was done in remote Canadian towns before they got TV. 
And then they went back two years after these towns got TV, there was a drop. Satellite, satellite, satellite TV. TV. Yep. yep. There was a 40% drop in creativity. Aggression at school had increased, had doubled, and kids' reading scores had dropped. So it was just <laughs> wow. huge impact. So, you know, when parents can, can talk with their kids about this kind of research in a lighthearted way, not mm -hmm. this is going to turn your brain to mush, which is what they often say. Yeah. No, buddy, I see you just, you used to be so creative and I'm not sure you're quite as creative. And I'd, I'd love to talk with you about that because I love your creativity. It's a mm -hmm. God given gift. Mm -hmm. So let's see if we can figure that out. Mm -hmm. It's lighthearted, but it, it combines that brain science with the scripture. I, well, I love that. And, and that reminds me of like Colossians 3.12, which gives us a good approach when we're coming to issues that need to be dealt with like that, like you just mentioned, which is therefore as God's chosen people, holy and dearly loved, clothe yourself with compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience versus the, your mind is going to be mush, go outside and climb a tree. <laughs> yes. Right, right. Yeah. As we come to our kids. I wish it was also included in the, in the Galatians passage about the fruit of the spirit. Cause I really believe mm. humility mm -hmm. is part of walking by the the means of the spirit that's within us. And, and I, I honestly believe that our greatest currency, and we say this in so many different ways and times at Connected Families, our greatest currency for deep, true, lasting influence in our kids' lives flows through the portal of humility. And when, and when we can attach humility to all the other good intentions and, and good things that we do as parents and let our kids know that we're also human, we're also learning, we haven't solved it yet either. We gain their ear, we gain their attention. They, they feel more joined and less opposed when we let them know, hey, we struggle too. Yeah, right. Well, we just have a couple of minutes left. I'm wondering, Lynn, if you could hit correct <laughs> in just a few minutes. And then I know that we can give any links or any more information in our show notes, but talk about correct. Well, it's interesting that parents so often equate correct with discipline and discipline with imposing consequences or punishment or punishment. Right. Mm. And discipline is rooted in the word discipleship. So I think as we keep that in mind, as we talk about that, that gives us a good framing perspective. You know, as parents early on, we wrestled with how to discipline our kids and what does it mean? And we had you know, very strong, immediate obedience, or you are going to be punished. And it was the, the default punishment was physical. And we wrestled with that. And as we wrestled with the scriptures, which, you know, were they metaphor? Were they literal? What does it look like? Farther on, we, we saw the research that helped us to solve that dilemma because we were committed to following the scriptures. But when I found the research that the more a child is physically punished or spanked for disobedience, the greater the, the more a child is physically punished or spanked, the smaller the right frontal lobe is in their brain. It diminishes the gray matter that's mm -hmm. in that right frontal lobe, which is the area associated with empathy for others. And it's like, well, then Jesus would not want this to be the default for how his church is being raised to diminish their compassion and their empathy for others. So when we're really wanting to follow that scripture, and sometimes it's confusing, that's where research can mm -hmm. help us. And we talk about that more in depth in our spanking ebook, and we will put that yeah. in that link in the show notes. And, and I just want to clarify quickly, Stacy, this doesn't mean that we are anti-spanking. Right. It, it means that we're inviting parents to be aware of the research about what spanking does in a child's brain and to, to be thoughtful, even prayerful about that information as it relates to their own work to teach, train, discipline their own children. What we know for sure, and we're not advocates of, is that lots and lots of spanking is counterproductive. Mm -hmm. People occasionally will say, well, I got spanked a ton and I turned out. That's true. It happens, but it's the exception, not the rule. Right. Uh, pretty large bodies of research. It's good. Well, and I know you, and I know us at Connected Families, and scripture will always overrule 
research. And that is our foundation. So I appreciate that. We're going to have a link to that spanking ebook in our show notes, but Jim and Lynn, this has been a fantastic conversation. Again, something that we all, all three of us just love talking about science and the Bible and putting that together. So thanks for this conversation today. Great to be part of it. It was a privilege to do it with you, Stacey. Thanks. We want to hear from you. What did you find helpful from today's episode? Let us know by sharing a comment. And while you are there, please rate and review so that others can find us more easily. There are many ways that you can connect with us. Over the last few months, we have been using Clubhouse to have live conversations and fun interactions. Every Wednesday at 7.30 a.m. Central Time, we open powerful prayers for our kids hour. We would love you to join us. To find all the information that we mentioned in this podcast or for more information on Clubhouse or Connected Families, go to our show notes or connectedfamilies.org. We'll see you next time.